Okay. Good morning, everybody. Peter James is my name. I'm the uh, Director of Career Life Transitions here in Perth, Western Australia. And today we'll be talking about the psychology of leadership. So uh, thank you for those of you who have submitted some questions prior to uh, uh, the session today. So we'll make sure that we, uh, we answer some of those outstanding ones. Uh, quite a few of the comments are pretty much around just general interest or uh, developing skills or learning as much as I can about, uh, about leadership. So the agenda today is really what is leadership and why do we call it the psychology of leadership? why it's different to management, what are, the, uh, what are the step from management to leadership and how do I start? Where do I start this whole process? So we'll be running for about 30 minutes today. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, uh, we'll have a little question and answer for you that want to uh, stay on or if there are some things that we covered you want some more information on or uh, want some clarity around. So welcome to our session. Okay, so what is leadership? Uh, interesting, I guess, this whole concept of leadership has just grown and grown and grown over the last uh, number of years. We used to talk about management, but I would say if you got on the internet and had a look at um, Google or Amazon or any of those, and uh, the most widely researched and most written about and papers and what have you is either on uh, change management or leadership. So it is certainly uh, very, very well researched. And you have to ask yourself if it was something that was so easily defined, why are there so many people uh, writing so many subjects about it and having their own theory about what's this and what's that? Because I guess leadership in the end is quite contextual. So the experts struggle to find it. And Warren Bennis talks about something, John Maxwell, uh, Justin Briso, Tom Peters, Peter Drucker. Uh, I guess that's the most interesting one, Peter Drucker. The only definition of a leader is someone who has followers. Uh, I quite like that one. So let's start with what is management. And management is administration. It has to do with efficiency and to find as product, production schedules, costs and resourcing systems and processes using a mixture of lead and lag indicators. Managers initially rely on extrinsic motivators to achieve their outcomes. So basically, I think as people move from uh, the tools, technical, and they tend to, in Australia, we have a, uh, a promotion system that does lead people down the path uh, when you want to step up to the next level in your role uh, through the technical aspects of it, you... Um, you uh, then start to... Uh, move into, uh, I guess, what you see as a management role. In other words, your technical skills kind of take a per certain percentage of your time, but what takes up more of your time now is monitoring, controlling, policies, procedures, all those kind of things that happen. And as we uh, really increase that span of control, which is what's happening in businesses, coming from the more or less, more with less syndrome, where you have uh, people who are managing quite a broad range of portfolio and resources, that whole management aspect of it just becomes uh, absolutely critical to the job. And it's, it's quite demanding, it's the here and now. So every day you can come into work in any kind of administration, supervisory or management role, and there's always going to be a pile of management activities that are, that are requiring your attention. But as I say, that is management and people become extremely efficient at management and can be promoted through the organization through their uh, ability to, to deliver and manage uh, the resources and productivity that are in their control. But it does have a downside. And I guess the downside and the little case study one here is really looking at leadership versus management. And we had the opportunity to coach uh, a very, very uh, efficient uh, manager and a very uh, highly technical skilled person, a uh, PhD in their area, an absolute expert. And obviously the expectation for him is to be promoted up into, and it was a he, getting promoted up into uh, the hierarchy of the, of the business. So using his technical skills, which is, uh, as I say, a very technical PhD, he applied that to management but he did not take with him any kind of leadership skills at all. He didn't, and the leadership skills in definition of engaging the people that are around him. 
And when I met with him, uh, I guess his management or his leadership team were really looking at him saying, this person has got to that stage where they're now disengaging the people around them. And I went and spoke to him about it. And uh, his response was quite interesting. I said to him, you know, do you ever take any time? People say that you don't, you, you don't engage, you don't say good morning, you don't ask people how they are, you, there's no kind of uh, personal interaction with them. And he turned to me and he said, I don't do any of that because I think it's disingenuous to say good morning to someone or ask them how they're being because I don't actually care, which was a kind of an interesting response to that. But what it was happening for, what was happening for him in the broader context was that people were disengaging from him. And as they disengaged from him, they made his job harder and harder and harder. So people started avoiding him. They stopped speaking to him. They stopped providing information to him. They stopped giving him a heads up about things. And coaching this uh, fellow uh, for a period of time, it was kind of interesting where I had to really start to point out the downfalls and really quantify the negative aspects of that kind of behavior and doing that, actually getting him on board where he could see that taking the time, even though he may have felt disingenuous about it, which was to my little, little extreme, but that he was actually getting better engagement and better support by even pretending to be, in other words, modifying his behavior to engage people. And he actually started to make a huge shift. So you could call that fake it till you make it. And as he developed those habits of developing people, he actually started to have a positive impact on himself and the workplace and has continued on to do quite well. So it is, it is an interesting aspect of that transition from management to leadership. So on that basis, our premise is leadership is an outcome-based relationship. In other words, that we are developing a relationship with the individuals that, that we would want, would want to follow us. So not only are we managing them in through command and control, now we're actually saying, I, I need to start to have a relationship with you. And that takes time and effort. But if you take that to the top of the organization, if I said to any CEO, if I put something on the table that could add 25% to your bottom line, would that become a priority for you? And I'm sure the answer would be absolutely yes. Interestingly enough, a lot of the research shows that transitioning a culture from average or poor to strong actually adds 25% directly to the bottom line. And that is through a decrease in cost, an increase in productivity, and uh, an increase in relationship with uh, stakeholders and, uh, and whatnot through uh, an increased alignment to, to the marketplace. So leadership has to have an outcome base. It's, it's outcome based in terms of the achievements that you're trying to, to uh, the goals you're trying to set for the organization. But it's setting up that time to say, actually, leadership has a hard cutting edge to it. It's not just a soft, nice to have. It's not something that I should be putting to one side as I really focus on and try and achieve those measurements. Because I find a lot of people who don't lean on relationships and work very, very hard on their management skills end up working a lot harder than they need to. So you're now almost starting to get caught up in this uh, vortex where your leaderships, uh, where your management and your management capabilities and the time you spend managing is actually getting more and more as you disengage with, uh, with the people around you. They require more command and control, which kind of makes sense. But leadership requires effort. It requires focus. It really requires you to take some time to say, I'm going to put my uh, focus and effort into developing my uh, relationship and interactions with the people around me. And it does require you to start to think about people and the psychology of people. So if you're going to move into a leadership role, and this is a conversation I've had with a number of people, they think leadership, management, their sets of skills, that a technical skill, professional skill that I can start to develop, and you go along and do your MBA and what have you, but that will make you a manager. Leadership requires you to go back and have a look at your interpersonal skills, your EQ, your emotional quotient, and your... Um, uh, ability to build relationships with your uh, with the people around you. 
So, as I said at the beginning, leadership, there are a lot of considerations and complexities around it. You know, what are the personal characteristics of the leader? What are the nature of the relationship? How do we see some people better leaders than others? What are the circumstances of vote? So these, I guess, are all the subjects of the myriad of books and what have you. Uh, they're out there talking about leadership. And when someone says, well, you know, you need to be a leader like JFK or you need to be a leader like Gandhi or you need to be a leader like somebody else. It is all contextual. In other words, I can't go and look and just list that, uh, those characteristics of that individual and say, okay, this is the definition of leadership. And if I put that in a different context, uh, I will get the same results. Well, that's not the case with leadership. So it is quite a uh, dynamic uh, subject, which means that learning it and focusing on it does require you to to engage in in uh, some kind of psycho psycholo psychological process to understand okay the the complexities of people in the context and the environment and when you start to talk about leadership like that it's no wonder some people get to a certain point and say oh no i'm just going to go back and manage it this is all getting too hard and especially as i said where you have quite a broad span of control is what's happening in organizations as they get flatter and flatter that taking that time to separate yourself out from that. But as I said, it, it is a vortex that's heading down the, uh, down the drain, basically, because it's only going to get harder and harder. And as I say, the impacts on the organisation through either anxiety of, uh, of um, the employees where they're not feeling like they're uh, being uh, considered in the, in the organisation, uh, all those kind of things, uh, absenteeism, turnover of staff, whatnot, they are the, the real, very real consequences of not engaging in some form of relationship with your employees. So a shared endeavour plus that relationship equals the benefits and outcome. So we all start with our, our, our unique being. So you are who you are as you move into a management or leadership role. But your behaviour is within your control. And I think that this is always the starting point of any leadership journey. Do you know who you are? Do you know what your auto responses are to things? Do you know what triggers you? Do you know what motivates you? Do, do you know what your values are? So understanding yourself is the first step in moving on that uh, journey to leadership. So on the left-hand side, we start, you have an outcome needed. So there is an objective. There is something you need to, happen, need to happen. For yourself, you go through that feeling, thinking, and then communicating that to the team. When it comes out to the, uh, the team on the other side, we are also then interacting with a unique being. And this unique being will hear what your communications are, and they will add their own thinking, feeling, and then reactions will be based on that. So if this feedback here, if that communication is delivered poorly, or your thinking is uh, is starting to uh, impact on the uh, on the values of the person you're talking to. How they think and feel and react to that is now in their control and may not be the response you want to get out of that. So that whole leadership endeavour of delivering outcomes as part of a team and organisation really starts with you, who you are, understanding yourself and having an understanding of the expectations of the, the individual you're interacting with and the team. And sometimes we do that through psychometric testing, that type of thing. And certainly when we employ somebody in a role, we do a, a battery of psychometric tests. But I could just about guarantee you that once that psychometric test is done in employment, that person has been successfully engaged, I'm sure that that test goes straight into the bottom drawers and never seen again but it actually has a lot of valuable information for you as that person's team leader uh, moving forward as to how you should and could interact with that person to get the best out of them. So to understand relationships, you do need to become a student of psychology to a certain extent. How do I think or feel? How do others think? What motivates and engages them and disengages them? What are group dynamics? What are the wide environment, socio factors that have an impact? And that all builds up to the psychology of leadership. If you want to move into that leadership uh, environment, you need to start to uh, learn what leadership is. And I was saying, talking to uh, an oil and gas organization yesterday, I said, pretty much if you had an oil and gas engineer and he took that semester off where I was talking about fluid dynamics and you dropped him into a role as a, um, dropped him into a role as a engineer on a, on a platform, he will do the absolute best or he or she will do the absolute best 
they can do to add value to that. But with that gap in their knowledge of fluid dynamics, it's never going to be the optimal outcome. And that's, this is almost like that transition to management and leadership. If you're not taking the time to stop and think and study about what the uh, what psychology of leadership is in yourself and how others think about things, then you're almost going into a role where you're not fully armed with all the information you need to do the best you can do. So there are real psychological benefits and impacts on people. So followers want, they want a vision, they want protection, they want uh, emotional and, and uh, mental safety. They want to achieve things. They want social inclusion and respect. That's what followers are looking for from good leaders. As you can see, management doesn't necessarily uh, hit all those factors. It might hit one or two of them, but it doesn't hit all those factors. Therefore, good leadership, the positive side of that is providing focus, loyalty, commitment, respect, pride, and altruism. Now, unfortunately, where we see leadership going off the rails a little bit is when leaders start to believe they are a target for political opponents. Pfeiffer said that uh, management is the fight for scarce resources in a, in a given context. Leaders tend to be action driven, even when it's not appropriate. In other words, let's just drive the results. And I don't really care about what you think about this. And the other trap they can fall into is objectifying people, ignoring their feelings. And the number of times I've seen uh, spreadsheets of projects and outcomes and all the rest of it and people interaction and, and the people, the factors that people bring to, uh, to a project are not even on that spreadsheet. So you end up with a, a spreadsheet of the business without an evaluation of uh, people's contribution to that, which, as I said before, that can have a massive swing on the bottom line, whether someone uh, is interacting with your market pro, uh, place appropriately, uh, how they're saving money, reducing costs, or increasing productivity. Some of those things are totally in the, uh, in the realm of, uh, of your employees to make decisions around. So you're really aiming for that uh, uh, engagement. I always find fairness as an interesting one. More than outcome motivates people to cooperate, reframes uh, they're from disruptive behavior and working for, for the common good. People tend to be more sensitive to fairness of procedures than to favorable outcomes in determining their commitment. What we're really saying there is that people are very, very uh, sensitive to looking in an environment and saying, this is fair, that's not fair. And when people start to line up those, this isn't fair, this person is getting that, I'm not getting it, this person's, and a lot of that even comes from when we try and set up competitions at work, sales competitions, productivity competitions, have two people competing against each other, when both are working really, really hard, and with a number of factors outside of either of their control, they allow one to get in front of the other and win that, that award, given they probably both put in the same amount of effort and factors outside of the control dominated the outcome, creates this feeling of unfairness. And when I feel like things are unfair, then I try to balance the ledger. And that's when it starts to get a bit of dangerous. So, I mean, another little case story, uh, story uh, coaching Brian. Brian had a really uh, sensitive uh, response to fairness and he was really uh, quite attuned to that. So when he went into meetings and what have you, he was almost going into that meeting to start off with, to listen to things that weren't fair in his mind. And it was purely his definition of what was not wasn't fair. And the, the issue was basically that uh, Brian, when he felt things were unfair and, out, and, and not in, in his favour, if you like, he would actually get quite aggressive and, and explode. So you had, once again, a very, very highly technical person put into a leadership role uh, to engage with stakeholders, customers, and his own team, who was hypersensitive to, uh, to unfairness as he saw that and reacting to that. And I guess going through that coaching process and working with him is having a look at, once again, the consequences of that and going back and revisiting what he was trying to achieve. Now, I would never say that any of his aggressiveness or anything was malicious. Uh, in, in fact, his intentions were, were always good, but the delivery of it 
was poor. And that comes back to that whole communication process is how I think and feel about something, who I am as a person without any modification to uh, uh, moderate my uh, responses to the triggers ended up with really poor communication to the other side, which was disengaging his team and, uh, and his stakeholders. Okay, so I mean, these are the kind of, I guess, human, natural human interactions that uh, in responses we, we fall into the trap of in terms of uh, just being human in the workplace. And we see this uh, unfairness, we see these other triggers that are happening around the place that we're responding to. And that relationship uh, can be damaged. So the easiest way to, uh, to avoid attachment killers or like the, our attachment to, uh, I guess, things that we feel are uh, attacking who we are in our position in the organization or what we see as fair, you want to be careful that you don't respond in this way. And I've seen managers, I won't call them leaders, I guess, who feel like either uh, something is unfair to them, that uh, their status has been challenged in some way, that they're not in control of their state of their next uh, control of their um, workflow, things like that. So there's no predictability for them. These are things that start to create uh, triggers in individual, which derail that leadership. And you know, we call it the four horsemen of the broken relationship. That contempt, rather accept uh, the other perspective is valid and apologize for any uh, talking down, but criticism, avoiding that defensiveness saying yes but and stonewalling withdrawing emotionally and what have you uh, and as i say you know working in organizations or what have you i'm sure you've seen this behavior and it's bad enough when these behaviors are happening amongst team members but when you start to see uh, uh, leadership uh, or management demonstrating these behaviors then you're really starting to uh, go down a slippery slope of damaging uh, that relationship almost permanently So case study three, uh, working with, uh, with Roz. Roz is uh, uh, very, very people oriented, very, very strongly re recognize and realize that uh, people's contribution engagement in the organization really added quite a lot of value to, to that. Uh, I guess she ended up taking on uh, someone in quite a senior role. And this person, uh, started demonstrating one of the narcissistic traits, um, which we call uh, gaslighting. And gaslighting is starting to divert their ineffectiveness to those other factors that are around them uh, that can be presented and appear to be out of their control. And unfortunately with, uh, with Roz, because she had a very, very uh, strong connection to engaging people and trying to develop and support people in the business, she put an awful lot of effort into this individual. In fact, up to um, 12 to 18 months uh, where this individual was just not really performing, but was able to divert uh, that, uh, I guess, the downfalls and, uh, and inability to deliver results to other areas of the business, which as I say, Ros being the person was, was trying to support that person through that. I guess that is the other side of not really understanding the relationship because being everyone's friend is once again, not being a leader. And I talk about that, I guess, I have seen some excellent leaders who are very, very clear as to where they draw the line and they're not everybody's friend, but they are a leader. So stepping up into that role and saying, this is unacceptable behavior and dealing with that is the other side of leadership. It's actually understanding humans and understanding inter interactions. So once I got involved in that, we were able to move this individual on reasonably quickly because that individual was creating enormous amount of damage and um, losing support and, and rods because of her seemingly inaction was actually losing support of the broader group as well. So, once again, having that understanding of the broader psychology of people and, and what's actually going on in some of these relationships, which is part of leadership, uh, will get you a better result faster rather than leaving it.
So there are many, many challenges and interactions and what have you going on. And it's very, very hard to try and figure out, well, which leader, which lever do I start to pull when things go astray? And I guess this is why there's so much information on written on leadership, because really very, very much about the context which you're operating in. So until you understand and take the time to stop and look at the broader environment and looking at not only the management side of it, but also the psychology and, and people interaction to it, are you going to be able to navigate through this? It's through your team, the members, and you as a leader of that team. What's really going on here? And once again, without taking the time to study the psychology of people and what have you, you can be thrown up with some questions as Roswell with, uh, with narcissistic and, and gaslighting in the organization, uh, problems that you may not recognize and are not coming up with a, a solid practical solution to deal with them uh, quickly. So it doesn't disrupt the broader team. It doesn't disrupt the organization. So the short answer to leadership Start with your own values, morals, ethics, and behaviors. Have you stopped and thought about what they are and written them down and had a look at the environment you want to operate in and how you want to interact with people? Be self-reflective, look for feedback, get a coach, a mentor. I know that was one of the questions that someone has submitted. How do I go about doing that? Well, people are usually quite flattered if you ask them to, to mentor you uh, or to, to coach you in some roles, but you really need to have a purpose around that and say, I'm looking for this support. Understand the solid and proven methodologies and models of what leadership are, is. As I say, everybody's got a view on what leadership is, but there are some good models which are uh, psychologically based around human behavior. So a lot of the stuff you're reading in terms of leadership are interpretations of that in a particular context. But you can go back to the, to the base models and say, okay, this is what I'm going to build my understanding on. So it is starting with yourself. Then it's starting and getting some feedback, getting some psychometric testing done, if you like, going back to the original test you probably did when you joined the organization, have a look at what your preferences are and start to think through the consequences of the extremes of that behavior. I've always found it really strong to look for role models. I, I don't try and copy and be somebody else, but I certainly have always looked at uh, people in organizations and, uh, and people I see and say, okay, what are they doing that's actually working well? And testing that for myself and saying, okay, the way this person introduces a conversation or the way this person uh, asks questions rather than makes statements, those kind of things uh, are when you see the effectiveness of that in a role, is something to, to take away and say, right, how do I make this mine? Analyze and evaluate your situation and target your interventions. As I say, there, there are millions of interventions, any kind of combination of those you go through. It's almost like music, if you like. I have a set of notes. There's a piano, piano keys, there's 88 piano keys, I believe. Uh, but how do I turn that into um, an infinite number of, uh, of combinations? Now, that's a little bit like uh, the complexity of leadership, if you like. There are infinite com uh, uh, combinations that you can apply, but it starts with a base set. And the key thing is about walk the talk. So we're huge fans of servant leadership. And that's uh, servant leadership is serving others first, as opposed to command and control, stick and carrot. Servant leadership starts to motivate people to want to be uh, intrinsically motivated. Command and control is extrinsic, where I'm, I'm now trying to uh, uh, manipulate people to uh, through either fear, flight, or, uh, or, or freeze, if you like, uh, and reward and, um, and censure. And that's servant leadership is I'm starting to move to the point of, uh, of engagement and looking for that discretionary effort. And the discretionary effort is really the, the oil and grease of the engine of your organization. So really servant leadership focused primarily on the well-being and growth of the other people around you isn't being the sole leader, it's sharing that power and putting others' needs above their own, enabling the growth of the team development so they can perform at the best of their ability. And some of these characteristics are interpersonal characteristics, my ability to listen, to have empathy, to have awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, commitment to growth of people and building community. They're the kind of things that uh, 
should be on your person development uh, list, as with all the management skills that uh, that you need to need to apply and will learn in that role. But don't be drawn into that management is the focus. You do need to free up the time to focus on these things and develop these skills in the same way you would develop any kind of management skill. So the integral model, uh, Ken Wilber put the integral model out and really in the left hand side, it's the being how and what we think. Okay, and these are your beliefs, your values, your attitude, commitment, empowerment, shared perceptions, norms, justice and fairness, ethics and morals. These are all the things that internally either sit within the individual or in the collective. On the right hand side is the doing, how we act. And this is around the external, the actions, the competency, skills, training, decisions, organizational resource appreciated. Now, you can see straight away that we do fall in and most organizations do very quickly fall into the right hand side of that and can be very, very good at those things. And that is the realm of, of management. The left hand side tends to be ignored, but the left hand side is where you can have a really massive swing in the productivity uh, and I guess the growth of your organization that we have, uh, we are, I guess, engaging in people's values and, and working with their attitude and looking at commitment, empowering them to work. So how do we bring that into effect in terms of the Integro model? Well, this is what, what the leaders do on the left-hand side. They, and that's who they're being, understanding, recognize, contributing, encouraging, supporting, development, respecting people, helping them perform their job, helping them work together as a team and treating people fairly. So we, that needs to sit in conjunction with the doing. And the doing is all the things that uh, we probably are already doing as part of management, delegating meaningful assignments, holding me account, behaving in a way that's congruent with state of values, et cetera, et cetera. You know, clearly uh, communicate what is expected. So the right-hand side there is a realm of the right-hand side of the integral model, which talks about the management aspects of it. So that is equally important, but at the same time, don't ignore the left-hand side with who you're being and how you're developing your team. So what are the next steps in your leadership development? Well, congratulations. If the fact that you've even just signed on and started investigating what leadership is, it is a great start. Start to take note of the characteristics of successful leaders that are already in your context. Look at the way, and I mean, quite leadership. I mean, I've, I've seen organizations where someone in the middle of the organization is actually the leader. That's the person they, they look to for, for the cues and what have you. The worst part about that is, is, is that you kind of are rolling the dice a little bit. So if a leader in the middle of the organization or even a lower part of the organization, if they're positive, that's great. If they turn negative, that's not so good. So you can roll the dice and let leaders just naturally uh, form in any kind of context or any kind of group. But if you are working in an organization, it's very, very dangerous to roll the dice like that. Start with self-reflection, look at your strengths and weaknesses, uh, and look at doing those surveys and assessments and reviewing those just to start to discover you because you can't understand other people unless you understand yourself. Look for some of those opportunities to take on leadership roles. And that may just be in a, a little team environment, a little problem solving uh, activity, something like that. Do go and find a coach or a mentor in the organization. So a coach is someone that, uh, like any kind of sports coach, is looking on the sidelines, watching what you're doing, understands uh, what you're doing and is providing you with direct input for that. A mentor is someone that's maybe not an expert in your area, but is looking at a bigger picture and is supporting your, your development. Become a student of people, become a student of social interactions and accept that you are on a learning journey. There, there is no end to the, learn, the leadership journey. As we develop and as we grow, uh, we start to build and learn and expand our understanding and knowledge. And at the same time, as we do that in a leadership role, we are attracting more and more people. So leadership is authenticity and strong values without compromise. And I guess this, uh, the last case study of this, I'm referring to uh, Justin Langer. Uh, Justin Langer 
when I'd met him and uh, spoke to him and uh, spent a little bit of time with him, very, very strong values without compromise and very, very authentic individual. <clears throat> and in the context of coming in after the, the ball tampering scandal and whatever in the Australian cricket team, uh, uh, really those things were what was required by the cricket team moving forward. But if you've read anything in the media about Justin, it he didn't adapt his leadership behavior quickly enough as the team started to develop and those interactions with, uh, with Cricket Australia. So he remains a very, very strong and authentic uh, leader. There's no doubt about that. And talking to him, you understand there, there is no compromise there in terms of that. But I guess it, looking at the whole cycle before uh, he left uh, uh, cricket and the uh, role of the coach, I would have said that that authenticity and strong values was really supporting the organisation that it was. But after the events flying on from there, you kind of have to sit back and say, okay, they, they still have a context and that context is moving. So if I looked at Dustin Langas five years ago and said, here are the list of things that a great leader does and put it in a different context, you can see that it not necessarily will fit and you do need to be adaptive all the time. So as I said to you that we are career life transitions. We work with quite a number of, uh, of large and blue chip companies right throughout uh, uh, Western Australia and Australia. So we hear some of the things that we provide as services to, to uh, our, our friends and, uh, and client community, a leadership and development coaching. Um, we do a unique staff survey around uh, change. We look at restructure planning, at placement support, staff training, organizational uh, psychologists and staff and resilience training. So there are a range of things, anything really to do and support our people within the organizations and leaders within the organizations. And that transition of people through organizations is something that uh, career life transitions do and provide as support to organizations. So I think that just about brings us to the end of the presentation. That's, uh, that's 40 minutes. So Charlene, do we have any questions that have come up at all? Hi, Peter. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good morning. Unfortunately, I haven't had any messages come through this morning, just those questions that were pre-asked. Okay. Today. And I'll just go through those. I think um, Despina asked, how is leadership evolving in the new remote, hybrid and changing workplace? Well, it becomes quite difficult. Uh, which means, as I said to you before, it is going back and having a look at the context and saying, as the, those uh, shifts are occurring, how do I continue to maintain and develop the relationships I'm having? It's very, very easy to have someone remote and then sit down and say, right, here are the things I need to do in terms of management to, uh, to I guess, manage the, the situation, the context I'm in. What you need to be looking for is how do I start to uh, redevelop that relationship with the individual? Uh, Mary spoke about how to transition to supervisor leadership. Uh, I would say start to become a student of people. Um, Amina spoke about, uh, actually, no, it was Shannon, transition points for people going through from technical space to coaching, mentoring, and managing. Once again, that transition point is your decision to start to understand yourself and people and interacting with people. Charles talked about how to lead a reluctant non-alpha uh, non leader, how to lead as a reluctant non-alpha leader. Uh, some of the greatest leaders I've ever met, I would say are not uh, alpha, alpha leaders. If you adopt the approach of servant leadership, which is probably more aligned to um, uh, a quieter approach to things, then that is developing relationships and engaging people. So I don't need to be uh, at the front yelling, screaming and demanding things and command and control, which we spoke about. Have a look at adopting that servant leadership approach and that will transition you uh, from, I guess, what you think of as a leader or being that alpha, uh, alpha leader. Uh, to a more effective leader because the alpha leader I tend to find they come in they stir things up and they move on to the next organization they tend not to be there for the long term because people in relationships it only attracts a certain number of people 
Uh, and Virginia asked, how to ask for a coach or mentor within the organization suggestions on starting the conversation? Well, I guess the first thing is to sit back and have a look at uh, where your next step of the organization is and where you currently are and have a look and do a little bit of a gap analysis and say, well, how do I get from here to there? Once you kind of understand what that gap analysis is, and that too may be in technical management and leadership, having a look around the organization and say, okay, who do I admire for their ability to, uh, to uh, provide that, um, that or to deliver that well and go and have a chat to that person and start with a compliment. I really admire the way that you engage people. I really admire the way that you're so effective in your management. I really admire uh, your technical skills in this area. Could I take some time to, to learn that and develop those skills? Okay, so okay, we, just, we just had a question come through. Sure. From Ross, how to be a good influencer to people as a leader? Well, to... the, the first way, Ross, is, as I say, take the time to understand yourself. And understanding yourself, it's like someone described it to me once, it's like going into or pick up a map or going into a shopping centre. You've got a whole range, but until someone puts a map in front of you and says, this is what the boundaries of the terrain look like and you are here, then it's very, very hard to kind of navigate your way through anything. So the first step is, well, what is the context of, of human behavior? What are the context of what I'm operating in? Where am I at the moment? Or what are the boundaries of that? And what are the other things I can start to learn? And once I start to develop and learn those, those skills and practice them, I mean, just picking up little techniques. The key thing about it is looking at or picking up a little technique or getting some advice and, and then making it your own. And it can be one or two things at a time. You're just sort of saying, I'm going to try this and see what kind of reaction I get to it. You may need to modify a little bit, but make it yours. Try it, move on to the next thing. Because the learning comes from the positive re uh, responses you get. And you may trip over a couple of times, and that's just natural. But keep at it and start to, uh, I guess, expose yourself to uh, a, a broader range of behaviours because it's that ability to modify and engage a broader number of people, which is pretty much leadership. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Charlene, do we have any, anybody else? I think we're just about spot on time. I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Peter James is my name from Career Life Transitions. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, we uh, are on email. We have a website, and uh, you can give us a call as well. We'll be sending out a copy of this uh, presentation to, to everybody that uh, has signed up for it. So I hope you uh, have enjoyed it. If you have any further questions or anything like that, then please just email that through, and we'll respond to that. Uh, outside of that, have a fabulous Thursday, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.